Hello, I'm Julia. Welcome to the Mind Matters panel. For a drama student, my teenage years were remarkably free of drama. But it's not the same for everyone. Here to help us figure out when you should be concerned about a young person are Young and Well Cooperative Research Centre Managing Director, Dr Michael Cargreg, Brain and Mind Research Institute Executive Director and Professor of Psychiatry, Professor Ian Hickey, National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health Senior Research Fellow, Dr Alexandra Parker, Alex for short, school psychologist Sarah Innes and teacher Martin de Klerk. But first, let's take a look at the Eagleton way. When you're in a school, you're in the front line of mental health. You're always alert, radar scanning for even the sign of a problem. Ah, take young Jackson, for example. Talented kid, but this year his artwork has got a bit out of hand. In fact, his whole behaviour. Hmm. Why? Well, one thing I have noticed. He used to buy his lunch from the canteen, but lately he's been bringing a packed lunch. Is this some sort of clue? Hello, Jackson. I see you're bringing your lunch to school these days. It's, yeah, uh, my mum's not giving me canteen money anymore. Oh. Family's struggling a bit financially, now, are they? No, 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 no. Uh, it's just that she's on this weird diet thing. It's all about, like, beetroots and cutting things a certain way. Dad's not at all happy about it, eh? Well, he says he loves it, but then I've noticed his car's got this weird KFC smell now, so... Sounds like a bit of tension there. Familial, financial, Dietary. What's that you're reading there, mate? Twilight. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Twilight. I think we've got enough there. Hmm. Yes, very interesting. Ian wears blue. Michael doesn't. Interesting. Interesting. There. Yes, I'm doing my little Eagleton <laughs> note taking. Phil talks about scanning for potential issues. What do you actually look for? I think that when you do have that relationship with students, that you can have a look for those obvious changes. So changes in classroom behaviour, changes in their social behaviour, changes in their academic performance as well. But bearing in mind that obviously, all young people have different ways of normal functioning. Some are quieter than others, some are more extroverted. It's just the way that things are. So to keep that in mind, but also to be looking for things when, when times do change, and that could be a sign that something's happening. Did, uh, did Phil do anything right, Martin? I mean, he got it right in terms of that he was, he was looking. Yeah. So, and you can get it right by getting it wrong. I mean, it's better to act and make a mistake. It won't be the end of the world then not to act at all. But maybe doing something a bit different about picking, picking the right moment as well. I mean, yeah. whether or not in that video, whether it's the right time to do it, out in the middle of, you know, lunchtime, lots of other kids around, mm. thinking about when's the right time to start that conversation as well and maybe for it to be more of a more of a conversation than an interrogation too. Mm, that was a bit of an interrogation, <laughs> wasn't it? So what is normal, Michael? What does that term even mean? Does it exist? Well, I think that there are things that we expect young people to do as they make the journey from childhood to uh, ad adulthood. Um, one is to basically, you know, there's a neurological veil that's lifted where they see their parents for the first time through adult eyes and their response is generally, oh my God, <laughs> look what I've got for parents, you know, people sent from planet boring to make my life hell. That's fairly normal. Um, we expect them to uh, explore their sexual identity. We expect them to uh, rebel a little bit against authority. Uh, we expect them to um, probably have a little bit of difficulty with the transition from primary to secondary school, but hopefully we then settle in. So I think the really important things to look for are kids who struggle with those key developmental tasks, keep an eye on them, monitor them. And really I like the model of teachers being the eyes and ears of the school mm. and then the higher life forms basically be the person 
person that they go to if they're concerned and then Sarah would do her investigation. Sarah, what kind of investigation would that oh, be then? Oh, probes, no. <laughs> <laughs> probes. Um, well, no, often it's, it's just gathering information and it's, it's a lot of... Um, my work is a lot of looking and listening, but there's also gathering information from teachers who work with them and parents who, who live with them and getting a sense of, well, is, is this what they've always been like? Is this a personality trait? Is this now more severe than it has been before? Has this been going for an extended amount of time? Is it causing distress for the student? Is it causing distress for family members and friends? Those behaviours that are starting to emerge. And that's why I think we start to start to want to intervene more. It doesn't take long to send an email out to teachers to just say, I've had some concern about this mm -hmm. student, can I just have a brief sort of report back on um, their welfare or their, their concentration or, or pinpoints and stuff? It takes two seconds to send out and then you can start to get um, build a better picture there is a key developmental thing to get straight. Mm. To get more emotional is normal for a young adolescent. Yep. That's a brain developmental thing, to react more and see it through more personal eyes, get moody, get whatever. If it persists, mm. you know, it goes on, yep. and it's associated with impairment, like it's affecting mm. their school performance or affecting their mm. social relationship, then you want all those eyes and ears to react. I'd like to highlight the importance of relationships, that no other time in your life is the desire to be with your age mates so strong. So if you get a kid who was and always seems to have been quite social and suddenly they withdraw from their friends, I think that's actually a very, very significant sign that you have to take notice of. Uh, and in conjunction with maybe a dramatic change in their behaviour. They're no longer enjoying the things that they used to enjoy. These are the things that sort of ratchet up the risk for me. Yeah. So if you do have a concern, Sarah, if it's starting to ramp up, mm. and if you're a teacher, what would be the next step? Well, I would hope that it would be drawing in the support they've got inside the school and, and parent support and possibly even um, knowing the supports around them outside the school, what GPs are, are youth-friendly, um, what psychologists are in the area or community services are in the area that might be able to be a good starting point for supporting the students who are that Headspace. Headspace. Don't forget our friends mm, no, at Headspace. That's right. <laughs> and online version too, so mm. eHeadspace as well. So if there's an centre nearby, that mm. um, yeah, there's the option for online counselling too. Yeah. Now, even if you're doing your best to pay attention, will you always know what's going on inside the head of a young person? Absolutely not. <laughs> Be really careful about making up explanations. Mm. I mean, one of the problems when kids go under the radar here is everyone goes, oh, well, I know what's going on. You know, it is grandma died or this year's stressful or whatever else. So it, it, we've got to be just a little bit careful. When problems really do persist, and the sort of things Michael was talking about, people withdrawn, they've changed. One way of normalising that is to make up the explanation. Mm. We all think we know, but no-one's actually actually mm. kind of looked at an issue as to why that is the case. So, you know, the levels of getting to a reasonable level of assessment and understanding is a critical issue with the person themselves and with those people who are in that wider context. And then being well aware there is a bigger health system out mm. there these days that can actually help with that. That's not the role of the school or the teacher individually to do all that. Mm. But, you know, just assuming you do know what's going on in people's heads, mm. often, <laughs> anyone's <laughs> head, let alone the heads of teenagers, mm. you know, just be a bit careful because we all think we know a lot. Often we haven't got it straight. Can you miss mm. signs of mental health difficulties in a student that's flying under the, the radar? I, I absolutely admit that I have. I think I've been doing this for about 30 years now and um, any psychology says they haven't is a liar. And did it surprise you that you hadn't seen it or could you have, with hindsight, did you see why you missed it? Um, yes, in hindsight, you're a genius. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, looking down the retrospective scope, I think you get more experienced in time and sometimes the kids know you. Yes, Ian? They, they, yeah, they'll well, tell you stories. I mean, you know, people, the more and more intimate something is, you're not telling everyone, not everyone, isn't telling everyone everything mm. the first time. So lots of kids go mm. under the radar. We don't see the problem. We see the kids who want to burn the school down. We see the kids who are destroying stuff or being arrested on the weekend. You know, the obvious behavioural stuff demands attention. A lot of the other stuff on the inside, emerging sexuality, emerging other difficulties, social anxiety, it's not causing trouble. It's not seen. But a lot of that's associated with very desperate thoughts, mm. you know, particularly thoughts of self-harm, really serious identity issues. They take a while to disclose, and they'll be disclosed in relationships in which people trust Absolutely. and they feel the other person understands, you know, there's some mm. empathy in those. And that doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen immediately with no. professionals. Mm. And really importantly, Somebody else you do trust, a teacher, mm -hmm. a peer, somebody else who figure, gets understand what's going on in your head, you're much more likely to tell than somebody you've been sent to see yep. to yes. tell everything to. Yeah. Yes. Best friend's mum. Yes. Very important <laughs> yeah. person. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and then if, and if, a, you know, if a young person has disclosed some thoughts about 
self-harming or, you know, that they have been self-harming or they have had some suicidal thoughts. Again, to not think that you have to jump in and, and problem solve at that point, but just to, to listen, to hear what they're, what they're saying, and then, but to know how to then tap into the next step mm. of resources that you need to get them the support that they have. Um, to not be reactive in the way that you respond, to think about your own emotions at that time, um, but then to just gently encourage them and know how to help them get that next step of help that they need. Did the anyone table. notice Chris in the video, in the Eagles in the video, <laughs> up the back, you know, still suffering the breakup of the girlfriend? Obviously, in that case, you know, Phil hasn't seen him, but that must happen. Well, it's really easy to focus on the externalising bad behaviours, isn't it? The in loud school, ones. The loud ones, the ones who make the most problems. Um, while the quieter um, sufferers who put their masks on to come to school every day tend to get overlooked. Um, so, yes, I think Phil has missed something by focusing on something, uh, one particular issue in the school. And I think we do that at schools if we're not careful. We can... We can miss that if we're not connected to our students. But this is the complexity, isn't it? I mean, these things are not simple. So sometimes we have a very simple community narrative. Life events happen, people get distressed, that's mm. the explanation. The more connected you are, the less chance you'll have those disasters and those things. Mm. Yeah. You know, the disclosure point that Alex is making, people do write it down. Now they write it down on social media. Now it's shared. Yes. Everyone, older non-digital natives, go, ah, no, bad. I mean, I wouldn't We're going, actually, in a million years like anything. One of the advantages of the new media, which everyone's sort of been in panic about, is the sharing of things. Oh, my God, if she writes about suicide, they'll all do it. But actually, it's the capacity to actually connect and respond, to actually make it a thing, take it outside and have the capacity that somebody else will be able to help somebody That's who right, themselves yeah. is not able to mm. get that help. We've got to stop yeah. demonising social media. Yes. The Young and Well CRC has done lots of research which shows, in fact, that it can build resilience. Being on Facebook is a good thing, oh, not a really? bad thing. Really? Yes. And, and a lot of young people send you the research. are oh, I'd love they're wanting to, to know. Actually. They're wanting to know, how do I help a friend? Mm. And so they're seeking that advice. Mm. And so we need to be in that position where we help them to know what to say, mm -hmm. um, and also how to encourage that formal help seeking, help seeking when it's needed as but well. But this goes back to before the internet. Julia's point's really important. People wrote that down forever. Virginia Woolf wrote down she's going to kill herself mm -hmm. forever. No one responded in a you know in the same yeah. sort of way. Yeah. Actually, what's happening on the social media, like taking it outside so you can actually start to deal with it, is the opportunity this presents. The more connected you are, afraid mm -hmm. to say, Facebook's really good for you. Yeah. The more connected you are, the more that somebody will see she's behaving differently or whatever, and if they see those other things, they're likely to say, look, there are strategies, there are things to be done, there are options to mm. actually help. Just mm. saying to someone in trouble, you should do different, you should get help, doesn't help. Other people need to provide that help mm. at key times, and that's the opportunity social media adds to social connection. And the real issue yeah. in schools is, as you say, it's terrible. Oh, it's great what you're doing in the schools. If there are three kids in the school that no teacher identifies, yeah, that says heaps, you yeah. know. Mm. But that's a real responsibility for the social mm. environment. It's not just putting the, mm. just the end of the year, your kid's mm. done very well, whoever they are, I don't know who they are, but they've done very well. Mm. You know, that's, yeah. that's a school that's doing something really socially responsible mm. that's yeah. smart. But we also know young people are far less stigmatising than older people, mm. right? So that the whole stigma idea we have, mm. which everyone's totally preoccupied with, mm. arises with age. Mm. So this stuff gets shared amongst younger people with no other assumptions about the person's a bad person or are no longer worth being a friend. We've got issues about mental health, we've got issues about guilt, is it our fault, what do we do? I get all the responsibility too. Yeah. But the opportunity with young people, I mean, Martin's making a key point, is it actually very helpful to encourage young people to do what they're already doing, to share the information, to disclose, to pass it on to others. What they often don't have is the answer. Mm. You don't want to be stuck in the cul-de-sac of 15-year-olds taking care of 15-year-olds yeah, because mm. they don't have the experience. So that facilitating the issue, and I think the bullying examples, we've seen this in suicide prevention, much of the smarter responses are coming from 15-year-olds organising themselves on social media to actually help the person yes. than what is coming from the outside world, which is having a panic attack mm. over are we doing the right thing or mm. not in these areas. So there's a whole issue here. We've got to make use of what we've already got. Re uh, an awareness, uh, a non-stigmatising attitudes, and then back it up with the mm. school environments mm. and the professional situations that then can take over responsibility and for those in serious trouble, get them on a path to recovery. Mm. So let's wrap up with a takeaway message, Dr Alex Parker. What is the most important thing you want to tell school staff? I think for this is to not be, um, not be afraid to ask questions, to not be afraid to give the time to listen and then to actually know who to, ch who to go to in the next phase if you need to. Take on as much information as you can from peers, from parents, from other staff and then formulating what is the best approach to help that young person. I think she's correct.